Hi, Lorraine Phoenix. Thanks for having me on House Arrest. And where are you from? Uh, that's a funny question because I moved around a lot, but I'd say what I called home for most amount of my childhood, teen years, was Gainesville, Florida. I haven't been there for many years, but I still kind of think of that as home. When did you start making music? When I was three, I started singing with my brother, River, and um, my parents were like, so I just kept doing it because apparently I had a, a good singing voice. I think when you're three, you're not even, you know, you don't even know what a voice is, much less the concept of it being good or not. Which I love about childhood, you don't have a lot of attachment to, sure. uh, you know, um, uh, of a identity. So it was just I opened my mouth to sing and apparently it was much loved and I just kept doing it because that's what we did. We played music together. And who did you listen to growing up? Uh, a lot of different artists. You know, I think for a lot of kids it starts with what your parents are listening to, right? So. I remember he hearing a lot of Steely Dan and Carole King and James Taylor and uh, Neil Young and um, Bob Dylan. And then, you know, in my teen years, I'd say I started listening more to like what my older brother was listening to, and that was um, Talking Heads and Squeeze, XTC. Um, and then got turned on by my like, high school friends to Kate Bush, which I became a bit obsessed with, if I'm honest. Uh, Peter Gabriel, U2, you know, um, and also really liked African music. I became a huge fan of Thomas Mapfumo. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's from Senegal. And I, I cite him as definitely in my top five. Um, it just makes me feel so good, that music. Um, and I also did, I sang uh, classical for a little short time. I took university courses, and so I enjoyed singing art songs. And so suddenly I was kind of interested in hearing opera songs and classical for a minute there. So I, I like a lot of different kinds of music. Um, so yeah, that's what I started on. I think that was your question. Sorry. Cool. I ran on a bit. So how did you get started? beyond your singing at three years old. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, same, same way, it was my brother River who started a band, Alec is Attic, and invited me to be a forming part of it. So that was how I got started music. And we toured, I think I was not even 17 when we started performing and touring. And um, so it was just who I, you know, it was always who I was. I, was, I sang and I yeah. toured and I was in a band. And I didn't really, not to say I didn't have any say in it, but it was just sort of, that was what I did. I never th questioned it, you know? So that's how I got started, yeah. Do you remember what felt like your first break? I mean, I just want to equate it to like what it feels like when you connect with an audience. To me, that would be my first break, is when you have that, that feeling that it's not you singing a song or an audience watching you, it's, it's the symbiosis of the two together there's something really magical that happens when that's right, when you feel like you are communicating with a large group of people and, and they with you. Uh, that, to me, was the break. And I, and I think that may have happened as young as five, you know, when I was singing in front of a lot of people at a very young age, realizing all that energy was commingling. That was pretty, that was pretty special. So I call that my, my break. <laughs> So how did you decide that this is what you're going to do? Uh, I don't know. Like I said before, it wasn't really a decision. It was just who I was kind of thing. It was what I'd always done. Um, but in, in particular, for going, um, deciding to have a solo record for the first time in my mid-40s, that was definitely a conscious decision I made um, for myself to make this record River is uh, to bring him with me so to speak or to, to uh, pay homage to him um, with my first solo records sort of so that I could move toward a different expression with music um, yeah so I think this was probably the most conscious musically I've been um, 
in terms of like really having a, a, an urge and a, 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 a what's the word a intention intentionality yeah. to wanting to to go uh, be a solo artist like to call it Rain Phoenix and actually make a record yeah. it was the first time outside of that I just kind of really love music and melody and I meet people and we start making music and then that's this band and then I do this with other people and that's that band and I don't know that I had so much intention as I do now um, so it and it's such it's not necessarily just for me it's not to just have to be a solo artist and um, be seen and heard and be somebody. It's more the opportunity with the intentionality around this record, the opportunity to speak about the universality of loss in a culture that doesn't want to talk about death so much and doesn't, you know, that we're scared of it. And I'm, I, I'm part of that too. So um, an urge to have sort of an open dialogue through the record, like to let my record do the talking, you know, and to let my shows be a, a hopefully a place that provides some kind of healing for people who are struggling with loss and, yeah. and also um, joy from it, from just mm -hmm. talking about it. There's something that happens. I don't know if you've had that experience, but when you're sad about something or angry about something and then you talk about a, it with a good friend or family member and through that process of, yeah. of discussing it, you feel lighter and you feel like you've like a load has you know yeah. come off of your shoulders. and. Um, I've noticed that with some of the live shows already that just the record being kind of melancholy and, and on the quieter or on the softer and, and darker side, so to speak, uh, melodically. And the conversations that happen while I'm on stage um, with the audience that after the show there seems to be a levity to the experience for and people connecting to it with smile, like we're smiling and, and joyful. So. I'm hoping that's what it kind of can provide is it sort of takes that that thing around loss that feels very lonely and like you can't share it because people don't want to talk about it yeah. um, and pub makes it more public and then there that, that brings some kind of solace to to those feelings and a joyfulness that's that's my my wish and so far the experiment that I didn't know was an experiment has uh, has brought that in a sense so I'm really um, it's been a joyful experience even with subject matters you know technically on the sadder side supposedly I've, I've felt a lot of joy from the experience of making the record and then being able to share it with others what prompted you to go for it now well like I um, I guess it was around the 25th anniversary of my brother passing away, I just, um, it just started happening and um, yeah. I cut together a video of his and I put it out on YouTube, you know, no fanfare, no press, I just wanted to provide it for the fans and, mm -hmm. and that was like the beginning of like it, something just kind of opened and it yeah. felt like, oh, I have to keep going with this and I put out a single um, alongside two of his songs in February of this, of yeah this year 2019 and then and then I couldn't stop making songs and I was working with um, my producer and collaborator Kirk Kelly and we just kept writing and we kept producing songs and uh, next thing I know there was a record worth of things and I and I and through the process of making that I I realized I want to call the record River and I want it to be an homage to him and mm -hmm. to sort of bring him into the conversation and bring you know all these the subject matter of, and you know, the universality of loss, but you know, you need to make it personal for it to be universal, I think. So to connect him to that was super important. Um, Cause I think in some ways, like it's very, you don't, it's a hard subject to talk about with just in general, but yeah. you know, I know from my own experience. And so that might help someone else connect on and with their own loss. And, and unless I'm honest about that and willing to talk about it or at least pay homage to it, um, it doesn't have the same power and connectivity to others, I don't think, so that was sort of how it came about, pretty organically, it yeah. just kind of kept snowballing, it wasn't, uh, it started modestly as trying to produce a video for him, you know, for his music. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Who would you most like to collaborate with and why? Like outside of a band, like... Thank you. 
thinking. This is thinking music. It's like elevator music, but it's thinking. Uh, David Byrne, Brian Eno, PJ Harvey, Beth Orton. What are your passion and interests outside of music? I absolutely love to work with other artists and um, I believe the artists are the, I think the word is harbingers of um, culture change. And so the more that we can support each other in the artist community, um, the more that we can kind of stand up and choose to change the things that aren't working. I've been thinking a lot about how we just assume the rules of society and the rules of how you do things is, is fact. And the thing I love about artists that really are passionate about what they're making, regardless if it quote unquote matters, is that it's, it's, it has the potential to change things completely because they're, they're crafting a new way. There are no rules, right? So, so I like to encourage, my, my passions are encouraging other emerging artists and like myself and, and other artists to um, be the light switches for others and use their art to change culture, um, talk about politics, the environment, you know, animal rights, human rights through their work, but not in a sort of, not in a soapbox way, but more just allow the, the rule shattering, rule bending, mm -hmm. left to center artists to um, have a space to create and yeah. tell their stories so that we can change the things that aren't working through the creative because it's the most fun way to do it. Yeah. And I think it's the way that others, um, believe it because then they feel it because art is like that it, good art to me is when you actually feel it in yeah. your bones and in your heart and, and so I want to just encourage as many artists that are doing that today to have the space and time I mean my biggest dream is to just have a you know a space where they don't have to worry about anything but making art and changing culture like yeah. so in small ways I do that I have a podcast launch left that um brings well-known artists there to ask them to highlight emerging artists as a way to sort of spotlight up-and-coming really good musicians um, and hopefully all artists eventually but we're starting with music which there's so much out there it kind of be nice to skim the top of like who's doing the most rule-bending stuff so yeah. so that's been one avenue for it but um, Launch Left is also really just about launching all kinds of left of center artists and people who might be the next Beatles or who yeah. might be the next, you know, um, Aretha Franklin or somebody who's just like changed things. Eno is a great example of that. Somebody who just really changed so much of music culture because of his production of other artists like David Bowie. And yeah. I mean, just, yeah, he's one of those people on top of my list. But. Anyway, um, yeah, that's really my other passion. And how long have you been doing the podcast for? The podcast just launched September third, two thousand nineteen. But I've been doing launch. I've been formulating yeah. and, and and doing large scale like um, production, produced large scale concert events and and different. Um, Launch Left is sort of this big idea, and so I, with the small resources I've had, I've tried it out in many different ways. Mm -hmm. So since about 2010, when I first put it to paper, I've done all kinds of different versions of Launch Left, but the podcast just recently launched. It's a new iteration. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's that's one version, but Launch Left is also releasing my record, so it's a label as well. Awesome. Yeah, and it co-released the, the previous single with Michael Stipe singing on Time is a Killer, and so that sort of made me realize, oh, it should be a label too, so I have a, a roster of artists I'm excited to help with their music, hopefully in 2020. It's always about um, money, and until it becomes a gift economy, it will be that way. 
you know. So, <laughs> so, but once it's just a gift economy, we won't have to wor even worry about that, right? But yeah. in the meantime, that's really all that's holding up Launch Left being this sort of much larger um, space for artists to come have safety, marginalized artists to feel safe. It's a big part of it, and to have a place to create and and to give and then turn around and give back to those that they know that don't have that. So it's really just like this solidarity engine yeah. between in the artist community and the idea of stacking kindness on kindness so that we can change culture to be one that's about kindness being cool and not we gotta step on other people and compete to get yeah. somewhere. So that's that's my my greatest passion. I love music but like to see a world where that's where artists are coming from. Yeah. Wow. That's 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 my dream. Excellent. <laughs> that's really good. So what's your favorite book, film and music right now? Um wow. Book, film and music right now. I just was given a Kate Bush book last night from my dear friend Chris Tucci, who's also creative directing with Launch Left and has done a lot for us. And he, it was her, I guess it's her book of lyrics, and I'm forgetting the name of it, but you can look it up. Okay. It's, it's, it's her book of lyrics. And film actually would be the Joker. I saw it recently and was, I still can't stop thinking about mm -hmm. it and what it means, what it was really trying to, potentially what it was trying to say. What's great is that it's open for interpretation and I'm sure everyone will take different things from it. But first of all, it's an art film, which I did not expect, mm -hmm. you know, and Secondly, it just spoke so much to me about society and, you know, where we're at now and what we're afraid of. And it really hit all these buttons that has made me think a lot about, like, just how how dark these times are. There's a lot beautiful going on right now, but there's so much that is um, so painful. And, and it also, you know, highlighted the importance of just caring for each other, yeah. like how important it is to not overlook people who are scary or yeah. we think, oh, they're, they're just not right in the head or that, you know, like that, how important it is to be, to, you know, care for all of humanity and all beings for that matter is, are my beliefs. But, um, so yeah, that movie really, I'm still, like I said, I think about it all the time since I only see it once. I'm not even sure I'll see it again, but it was so intense, you know, but it definitely made me think, um, a lot. And, and let's see, you said music. God, I've been listening to a lot of, uh, because of Launch Left, I get so much new music too. So music wise, I've been listening to Noi in EU. This record is really special. Listen to front and back. It's a white label with like an orange text in EU. Fantastic. Just ambient, cool. I really like experimental and ambient music too. And I also like monks chanting. Mm -hmm. I love to just listen to chant music. Yeah. <laughs> I think maybe because I make so much music and I see so much rock and roll or uh -huh. folk or, you know, sometimes just. Hearing ambient music yes. is what I'm into. So yeah, Noi. You, I'm, I'm so happy I get to be the one to tell you about it. Yeah, check it out.